The Cannabis Conversation. A European perspective on the emerging legal cannabis industry. Welcome to the Cannabis Conversation with Anoush Desai, where we explore the new legal cannabis industry by speaking to the professionals that are helping to shape it. Hope you've all had a good week. It's been a busy week on the news front. Switzerland, Luxembourg and Costa Rica have all announced varying levels of law change in relation to cannabis. Switzerland in particular is a very interesting development and uh, will be looked at with great interest by the rest of Europe. On a personal note, I am pleased to say that I will be working with the guys at Invest in Denmark. They are putting on a medical cannabis symposium in Copenhagen on November the 8th. This is in partnership with the Technologisk Institute in Denmark. I will be the official conference rapporteur. Not a word I've heard of before, but I'm going to go with it. <laughs> Doing some interviews and bits of media, I um, feel very privileged to be asked and uh, excited to be covering Denmark. We'll record a, a few pod episodes when I'm out there as well. So expect a Danish flavour over the next couple of months. It's a really interesting space out in Denmark. They're doing some great things in medical cannabis, so lots to cover. I know I've actually never been to Copenhagen, so I'm really excited to visit as well. Uh, I'll also be making a trip up to Odense, where there are a few cannabis businesses based. If you're going to be in attendance at the symposium, please do drop me a line. I'd love to meet. But in the meantime, on with this week's episode. I'm really pleased to have finally got Professor Mike Barnes on the show. He's a very central figure in UK medical cannabis. Enjoy. On today's show, I've got Dr. Mike Barnes. Mike is Director of Maple Tree Consultancy, Chairman of the Medical Cannabis Clinician Society, and has a few other roles in the UK medical cannabis sector, which we'll talk about in a second. Really pleased to get him on. It's been long overdue. So, Mike, welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you for asking me. Pleasure to have you on. How are things? Oh, good. Thank you. Yeah, it's good to we're not quite through COVID, are we? But we're uh, we're slowly getting there, and it would be nice. It's nice to get out and about a little bit more, rather than sit on endless Zoom meetings all day. So it's good to be out and about a bit, at least. Yes, I couldn't agree with you more. Cool. Well, look, there's loads to talk about. We're going to talk about the future of medical cannabis in the UK. You're a very central figure in that. So there's loads of great stuff we can talk about. Let's maybe start where we usually do with a bit about yourself and maybe you can introduce yourself and what you were doing before and how and why you got into cannabis. Sure, I'll keep it short. Basically, I'm a doctor, I'm a neurologist and I eventually specialise in neurological rehabilitation, which is basically brain injury rehabilitation, people with traumatic brain injury after car accidents and such like, and also some longer term neurological conditions like multiple sclerosis. And it's in the context of multiple sclerosis that I got first interested in cannabis. And this goes back at least 20 years now, when a few people coming to the MS clinic I ran in Newcastle, where I live, were saying they, they use cannabis for their mainly for pain and for spasticity, that's muscle spasm in the context of any brain damage, but in that context in MS. And they were saying using cannabis for those mainly for those two things, sometimes also to help them sleep or reduce their anxiety. So just very informally, I knew nothing about it at all at that point, from a medical point of view. And I just asked everyone who came to the clinic, and that was about 60-ish people with MS coming up and down to the clinic every few months. And I just asked them, are you using cannabis? And about half of them were, which surprised me. Of course, 20 years ago, well, it still is, without a prescription, illegal, but it was very legal then. And these were often severely disabled people who were effectively criminalizing themselves. And I thought, well, there must be something to this, because these people wouldn't be taking this if it wasn't helping them. So that first sparked my interest, and then I was wearing a sort of slightly different hat. I was did a lot of work and research in spasticity, early days of botulinum toxin, which people have heard of Botox for wrinkle lines, but its early medical use was for spasticity, relaxing muscles. And I was approached by GW Pharma to help them with the development of Sativex, which some people may know is one of the two licensed legal medicines cannabis based and it's licensed in the UK for management of spasticity in MS. So I helped them get that license. That goes back I guess about 15 years now. They got the and credit to them. GW got the first ever license for a cannabis medicine a long time ago. It wasn't much used in fairness so I didn't do much after that for cannabis till about five years ago. 
and at that point I was asked by out the blue again for the all-party parliamentary group on drug policy reform which is a short and snappy title they asked me to do a sort of overview resume of all the efficacy of cannabis some of which I knew about but from neurological point of view some of which I didn't know about from a sort of psychiatric point of view or other conditions like Crohn's disease or whatever so I did that report I did it with my daughter actually who's a psychologist she did the some of the side effect profile the mental health issues associated with some cannabis and we produced that, and there was a funny position, because sometimes when you get thrust into the limelight a bit, because no one had done a report like that, and you suddenly become an expert without being a huge expert, because you haven't, no one else has written anything. So uh, that a bit propelled me a bit into the limelight, and then, to cut a very long story short, about a year after that, I was approached by the family of Alfie Dingley, Hannah and the people helping her. Listeners don't know Alfie has a rare epilepsy condition. He had two, three, four hundred seizures every week, in and out of hospital every week. Nothing else was helping him, so his parents took him to Holland, where, of course, they could obtain cannabis legally. And after about six weeks, the seizures reduced and eventually stopped. But they didn't want to live in Holland. They wanted to live in the UK. So they came back home and started a campaign to get uh, the law changed, which was actually a remarkably successful and very quick campaign. And from about March till summer 18... They were helped mainly by two lobbyists called from the Endal Pain campaign, it was called. And I was asked to apply to the Home Office for a licence. Those days it was a Schedule 1 licence because the law hadn't been changed. And in summer 18 we got his first ever cannabis licence for Alfie. And as a result of that, it was about four or five months later the law was changed. So I think we need a, a great debt to uh, Hannah and her family and to Alfie for effectively helping to, or being largely responsible for changing the law. So I got his licence, and then when the law was changed in November 18, I I then decided to retire from neurology. I was old enough to do that in the NHS, and I really work full-time cannabis. So now I, I do various things I'm sure we'll cover in a bit, but I'm mainly now cannabis media, lobbying. I don't really do any clinical work now. I sort of had to make a decision whether to do just cannabis clinics, prescription after prescription, which would have been fine, but I thought perhaps it would be more interesting to me and perhaps better use generally if I focused on media lobbying, consultancy and such like. So I don't any longer do any actual cannabis prescription myself that I did for a couple of years. That's a long story, but that's about it. That sums it up in the space of a few minutes. No, I think we could probably go into a lot more detail. There's so much you've done. And very interesting, you said that you kind of decided to focus on maybe using your profile and position to sort of Mm. affect the bigger picture. But if we could just take it back to the GW that you talked about, how were you on their radar? I mean, if you're talking way back. That's a good question. I think while they were looking to develop Sativex for spasticity, that's what they wanted to do. And I'd done a fair bit of research into spasticity management. I ran a spasticity clinic. I never asked them that question. Actually, I suppose they looked me up and see who's published what on spasticity. And they just approached me out the blue saying, will you help with this medicine? And it coincided with my review of informal, unpublished review of uh, what the patients were using. I thought, well, there might be something in this. So and now's an opportunity to see if there's something in this by doing it with uh, GW. And I didn't get the license. I was what's called the independent expert in it. MHRA, I think it was called something different in those days, review all the evidence and they have to have independent people looking at the evidence and saying, is this worth doing or do you need more work done? Somebody on the GW side, someone on the MHRA's side, and I was the independent person acting in that scenario. And eventually, it took quite a lot of effort. The guy doing that, Jeffrey Guy of GW, has just written his autobiography. Actually, I don't know if I can plug his autobiography for him, but actually it's, a very, it's an interesting story of, of the struggles he had to get the license for Sativex and more recently for Epidiolex. Yeah, I can imagine. I didn't realise that was as one for my Christmas list, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> and just to keep on GW Pharma for a second, you know, did it feel like groundbreaking or something you were doing kind of new or was it a standard kind of drug development process that you were involved in? Well, it was a funny mixture. I see why they did it. They had to really push it down the pharmaceutical route because they wouldn't have stood a cat nails chance, basically, of getting a cannabis licensed 15, 20 years ago if they tried to push it as a botanical medicine, if you like. So they got a, effectively an isolate or two isolates, THC and CBD. It's not quite an isolate, but nearly. And then you can do placebo control, double blind studies like any pharmaceutical product, which you can't really do with the whole plant. And that was the only way they could get it through. So it felt sort of half like a 
standard pharmaceutical process and half a bit, bit different, a bit odd. I wouldn't now develop it that way because I think if you develop a cannabis medicine as an isolate, you miss out on all the other benefits of the other minor cannabinoids, and particularly the terpenes, the so-called entourage effect. And I think the full-spectrum medicines are probably more efficacious than the isolates. But in those days, 15, 20 years ago, that's the only way they could have done it, and that's how they did it that way. So it did feel a little bit strange, but nevertheless, they pushed it down a pharmaceutical route and were successful in the end. Yeah, well, I mean, there's a lot of more stories to come from that as well. And then kind of finally on this, you know, when you were first started looking at it and you mentioned, you know, quite surprised at half of the MS patients that were coming in were sort of telling you that they were self-prescribing cannabis illegally. Mm. Did you encounter any stigma or did we had any hesitations in getting involved at all? No, not at all. I don't know why. Perhaps I'm slightly odd. I'm not sure. But I, I just viewed this is helping these people. Does it really matter if it's a plant that's got a sort of recreational stigma to it? And I never, I never thought of that as an obstacle. I thought, well, it's helping the people. It must be useful. Therefore, act as a medicine. I looked into it a little bit. You know, and it's the first medicine described known to man. And its medical history is actually more prominent and more robust, if you like, than its recreational history. So I soon realised that and thought, well, yeah, these are people benefiting from it. We ought to try and help them get it more openly than popping around the corner to your local drug dealer, and which is, you know, it's not the way to get a decent medicine. It still isn't, I have to say. So, you know, we've come a long way in the UK in one sense, but there's still only 10,000 people prescribed in the UK, and there's probably the best part of, I think the figure is 1.4 million users. So, you know, 10,000 is, is proverbial drop in an ocean, isn't it, to that number? So there's a lot of people still getting it illegally then, and I don't think now that they should be. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, let's talk about some of the things that you're doing now. Yeah. Maybe we'll start with Maple Tree, and then you can talk about a couple of the other areas that you're involved in. Yeah, well, Maple Tree came about when the law changed. I was being asked to do a little bit of consultancy for this firm, and that firm helped set up a clinic here and give some advice about how to import products, because it's all imported in the UK at the moment. Some local UK-based farmers were saying, how can I get a grow cannabis legally in the UK, not, not hemp, of course. At the same time, Hanno was, Alfie's mother, was also being asked to do consultancy from her perspective as a parent advocate and a very strong media profile and of course I knew her from Alfie's prescription so we just eventually decided about I don't know, about 18 months ago to join forces we called it Maple Tree that's it's a very interesting story because we call it Maple Tree because it sounds nice and it sounds a bit Canadian and but actually as some people may know and some probably don't I think it was about the 1960s, I might got the date wrong, there was a, a riot in Vancouver called Maple Tree Square, known as Maple Tree Riots, where there were people campaigning for legalisation of cannabis, and they were charged at by uh, police on horseback, and there was a bit of a riot. So it's the Maple Tree Riots, in the early, very, very early days of people trying to legalise cannabis. I didn't realise that when we called it Maple Tree, which is slightly odd, but it has a very nice cannabis connection if you like so now we run that together we've now got two other partners peter carroll and will de who are parliamentary lobbyists they were the people who helped alfie get his license when they ran the end our pain campaign and will and peter do our parliamentary lobbying side and hannah and i do the the other side of the business helping as i say helping clinics dispensaries importers growers education and training we do a lot of as well so that's maple tree that takes up most but not quite all of the week now Cool, cool. That sounds great. And interesting, you talk about lobbying, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. And maybe you could talk a bit about the Medical Cannabis Clinician Society. How is that working? Yeah, well, I thought when the law changed, we formed it in November 18. And doctors like Funny Breed, they like being supported by their colleagues, they like peer groups, you know, every specialty, cardiologists, neurologists, whoever, they have their own sort of society where like minded cardiologists or pediatricians can talk to each other education training conferences so we thought well we need something for cannabis physicians because there's nothing exists for them there aren't many of them in the early days in november there were none of them so we thought let's form a medical cannabis clinicians society which we did hannah actually runs it as the executive director i'm the chairman we've got a, a good little executive committee group and we've now got about 250 members and not all doctors, it's a clinician society, so some are clinicians, some are specialists, some are GPs, but also we've got pharmacists, nurses, and anyone sort of clinically at least working in the industry. 
Uh, that's good. I mean, I think we've got most of the prescribing doctors. I don't claim we've got all, but we've got most of the prescribing doctors, and we do a whole series of webinars. We've done, I think it must be 30 or 40 webinars, one or twice a month. We want to put on another conference. We were just about going doing road shows around different universities. When COVID hit us and we haven't done any, we're going to start those again soon. We produce, there's a how to prescribe booklet, there's a guidelines of how to prescribe, there's a sort of frequently asked questions on CBD, which is a bit of a confusing pseudo-medical area, if you like, the legally obtained CBD. And we do train, I do a monthly training session with drug science. So I hope, I would say that, wouldn't I, but I hope it's a useful, supportive society for clinicians in the country. And it does seem to be, we get two or three, four members every week now, so it's picking up. That's great. And yeah, a vital kind of forum to bring those sort of people together, which is, I think, vital to kind of yeah. move this all on. Yeah, it is. It is. We have a Google group. So if, if a doctor has a problem with prescribing or an issue they want to discuss, they just type it in the group. It's a private group and you know, they can get an answer from across the world, actually. We've got, they're not members because the UK is, but we've got partners, if you like, in the Canada and the States, in places like Uruguay, parts of Europe. So where they're better at prescribing than we are in the UK. And you can ask a question, you get an answer worldwide about, yes, I'd do this or don't do that. So it's, I think it's quite useful. That's really good, actually. I and mean, one of the questions I'll ask later is around the global context of what's happening in the UK. So it's yeah. really interesting that you've got that connection. And then as if you didn't have enough on your plate, you've just recently started the Cannabis Industry Council. Yeah. Um, would you call it a trade group or is it? I suppose it is. I think the sector's quite big now. Could be bigger and hopefully will be bigger. But there was a lot of companies, I say the clinics, the dispensaries, the licensed producers, there's those peripheral uh, like uh, law firms, patient groups, uh, parliamentary groups. And no one was really speaking on behalf of the industry as a whole. There were disparate groups doing this and that with no criticism of them, but there was nobody saying, this is the cannabis industry, this is what we want. It's a lobbying group, if you like, it's a trade association. So I thought, well, let's do this. So I wrote to everyone I knew of, which at the time was about 70 or 80 companies that join it, not people, 70 or 80. That's now grown to, I think it's 108 now. Um, the vast majority joined, therefore they presume they thought it was a good idea. We have only had a half a dozen who've said, no, and it's not for us, thank you. And so it does encompass the entire industry, from insurers to lawyers to the actual hands-on producers and clinics. I won't bore you with too much of the detail. We form five subgroups now addressing key issues. We represent hemp as well, so we don't have the individual hemp CBD companies, but we have their trade bodies under our umbrella, like the CTA, Northern Ireland Hemp Alliance, Scottish Hemp Alliance, and such like. So we have brought out a hemp subgroup, a research subgroup, medical cannabis, standards, I think it's really important to get our own standards in this industry, because there's some really good people in the industry, there's some, let's say, less good people in the industry who's out to make a quick buck. So we want good standards, and underneath that, we've got a media group and a lobbying group who can help get better exposure and, and influence government, and we've got an environmental impact group as well. So we've got a good, enthusiastic team. They're going to feed back to us next month, and our, effectively our second main meeting, where we have some priorities and see what we need to do and how much it's going to cost us and get on and try and sort the industry out, I suppose, hopefully. Yeah, yeah, fingers crossed and a great initiative. Well, thank you for that. You know, there's probably a load of other stuff that you're doing, but that's a great start <laughs> to chat about. So look, let's talk about, you know, the industry in the UK. Yeah. As you mentioned, medical cannabis was legalised at the tail end of 2018. Yeah. Where are we now? Well... We're not far enough ahead by any means. I mean, the big disappointment, I'll come to the positives, but the big disappointment is the NHS isn't prescribing, you know, 90% plus of healthcare in the UK is National Health Service, quite rightly. And they've been very reluctant, they being the doctors, but not helped by the political attitude of the hospital trusts, the clinical commissioning groups, and not helped particularly by very unhelpful guidance produced by, first of all, NICE, and then some of the other medical bodies, like the Royal College of Physicians, particularly the British Paediatric Neurology Association, I think they've been deeply unhelpful, deeply conservative, which perhaps you'd expect from British doctors, not known for their entrepreneurism, shall we say. And I've criticised them publicly, so I'm happy to do it again. I could spend the next 10 or 15 minutes criticising those bodies, but they've, they don't understand cannabis. 
And they look upon cannabis as a pharmaceutical product, which it is not. They look upon the lack of evidence as they see it as a pharmaceutical product. And I agree, you know, if you look upon cannabis as a pharmaceutical new drug, if you like, then there's probably not enough evidence. But if it shouldn't be looked at that way. You need to look at the real world evidence of controlled studies, case studies, observational studies. And there's a massive amount of evidence there. So for that reason, the NHS, largely that reason, the NHS hasn't prescribed. So the prescription, very sadly, has been virtually all private. There's three NHS prescriptions in this entire country in three years, all for high-profile children, surprisingly. You can look and see why that might be, that they want to, the media focus on those and the politicians and the people want to keep them quiet. So they give them a prescription hoping they'll go away, just to be cynical. So we've got three NHS prescriptions and we've got 10,000 broadly private prescriptions which is great that's 10,000 people with a legal prescription and hopefully though hopefully most of those people will be helped most will go back to their GP or their consultant saying look how this is helping me and spread the word if you like so we've got 10,000 advocates out there now which is great the pity of course is it is private and therefore they have to pay for it and it's very unfair that people are paying or some of the children are still paying four figure sums a month it's a little less of course for ironically adults need a lesser dose so but the average cost now is three to five hundred pounds a month. That's a lot of money for the vast majority of the population, except if you're on a twenty twenty one program by Drug Science where it's capped at hundred and fifty pounds a month. But even then, on top of that you've got to pay the consultation fees. So it's still you're looking at several thousands of pounds a year when you needn't pay any because it's legal and it could be prescribed in the NHS. So I think that's it's very unfair. It's very discriminatory, I suppose. It's only to those who can afford it. And I don't like it. Nothing wrong with the private clinics that are running, don't get me wrong. I'm mean, they i sure they do a good job, but they shouldn't be doing a good job in the sense that it should be available in the NHS. So in terms of what we can prescribe, I think there's 16 licensed producers now importing products into the UK with about 100 products. So in terms of what we can prescribe, it's not bad. That's hugely improved and still improving. We need more, a bit more range. We need more ways of prescribing it, like different modes of delivery. That's a long way to go, but we're a long way ahead in terms of what's available on, as, as say, 15, 16 clinics. So it's a decent choice. 70 doctors roughly are now prescribing actively from across a range of specialties. Some GPs are now picking it up as follow-up prescribers because they can't prescribe, they can't initiate prescription. So it's slowly getting there, but it's slowly getting there in the private sector, and I do wish it would slowly get there in the, or fast to get there in the National Health Service. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the patient access would just be... A different picture if it was on the NHS. Exactly, yes. So do you mind if I dig in and just, you know, these sort of terms get bandied around a lot and just sure. be great to fully understand. So would you just explain what the role of NICE is and, and what their position has been in relation to cannabis medicines? Yeah, well, it's a government-appointed body. I think they used to call them quangos, didn't they? I forget what they are. Anyway, it's not officially part of the Department of Health or anything, but effectively it is. It's a body that looks really at the cost-effectiveness of new medicines. So it doesn't have to be cannabis, of course not. It's a tiny part of their work. So if a new anti-blood pressure pill or antibiotic comes out, so is this, first of all, does it work? If it does work, is it safe? And if it's safe and works, how expensive is it? Therefore, they look at the, mainly their role is to look at the cost-effectiveness. Is this going to do enough good at a reasonable price? And indeed, they looked at Sativex in the early days and said, no, it's not. It's too expensive for what it does. So we're not going to recommend it. It's only a recommendation. A doctor can ignore that. But essentially, effectively, what NICE says goes. Effectively, it's mandatory. Because it's a brave doctor that goes against NICE guidance. And more particularly, it's a brave hospital trust that will say, yeah, you can prescribe that. The NICE don't recommend it, but we'll let you prescribe it. They're not going to do that. So NICE looked at cannabis. I think, and I will criticise them, they looked at it as a pharmaceutical. They therefore pretty well rejected it because they said there's not enough evidence, because they looked at it as a pharmaceutical. And if you look at it from that point of view, as I've said, I agree with them. But what you should do with a plant, the plants don't lend themselves to double-blind placebo-controlled studies. You can't do that with a complex plant with 100 cannabinoids, 100 terpenes, 147 cannabinoids, 100 terpenes. It's too variable. It's too botanical to be produced consistently as a pharmaceutical-like product. So you cannot assess it. As a pharmaceutical product, you have to assess it in a a different paradigm, if you like, as a botanical. And NICE haven't got the remit to do that. So I might criticise them, probably NICE would say I I criticise them unfairly, because they haven't got the remit to look at it as a plant. I don't totally accept that. So they were very negative. They were very negative. 
Do they look at other medicines that aren't pharmaceuticals? They look at medical devices. I don't know for certain. I, I guess they've looked at other non-pharmaceutical products, but mainly, not exclusively, but mainly they look at pharma- new pharmaceutical products. And they have adjusted their evidence for epilepsy. They were nearly taken to court. They backed off at the last moment on a judicial review and added a, a caveat to their recommendations that a doctor could prescribe for childhood epilepsy if the child has already responded. So the doctor on the NHS is allowed to continue that prescription if all else has failed. But that, that was forced upon them by the fact they might have just about to be taken to court, which is a great pity. So one of the lobbying things we're working on is to get nice or hopefully a different body to assess cannabis. Look at the evidence, and it's not right for everybody, and it's not right for every condition, but look at it critically as a botanical product. And then I think that if they did that, they would come to a different conclusion. Yes, we still need more research. Sure we do. But it will be, for what it does at the moment, it, it is safe, it's very efficacious, particularly for conditions where all else has failed. Yeah, and so that's interesting. You said there was a sort of modifying or slight softening of their stance, but it wasn't yeah. It kind of it wasn't a natural one for them. They were kind of, their hand was forced slightly. They were pushed into it. They didn't want the embarrassment of going to court and potentially losing. So they did a deal, basically. Yeah. Well, I mean, unfortunately, I think, you know, we've talked a bit about this on the show. Court cases are sometimes the way that things change. They take a lot of energy and money. <laughs> they do. But yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, I think, you know, it's a theme that's kind of been throughout what we've talked about so far. Doctor education is obviously very crucial to this whole unlocking this puzzle. And I remember interviewing another doctor who said that, you know, a lot of doctors' experience of cannabis has been quite negative And, you know, as in historically, I kind of feel like a lot of people have to unlearn in order to sort of accept cannabis. How do you feel about that? And what do you think is the general level and attitude of medical cannabis amongst doctors? It's interesting. If you ask a doctor sort of anonymously, and there have been a couple of such studies, do you think cannabis should be legalised for medical purposes? It's about 85% who say yes. If you ask that question, well, will you prescribe it then? It's the other way around. At least 85, if not 90 plus percent will say, oh, no, not for me. Now, some doctors had have a negative experience, and indeed psychiatrists are obviously having to deal with some of the issues of the very high THC uh, recreational use, the so-called skunk, I think it's the wrong word, but that's what the lay press use. Sure, and, you know, it's not safe for everyone, and people have got psychotic with uh, recreational cannabis. There has been real problems and real issues. But interestingly, the support we've had from the different specialties has been pain doctors and psychiatrists. Psychiatrists see the bad side of cannabis, but they see the good side because they know and now realise it helps with chronic anxiety, PTSD, for example, obsessive compulsive disorder. So a lot of the doctors, though, are still very negative. And I think, I'm sorry to say, that's out of ignorance. It's the stigma, it's the recreational view. These are just people who, you know, old stoners who claim to have a bit of back pain so they get some free weed. You know, that couldn't be further from the truth. I'm not going to say that never happens. Of course it does. But doctors who finally get educated and prescribe it, it's a very, very rewarding because, you know, the success rate is broadly 80%. Now, by which that I mean, if you've got chronic pain, everything else has failed. You've got chronic anxiety, everything else has failed. Epilepsy, everything else has failed. You try cannabis and about 80% of the people prescribed it properly respond, at least to the degree of, yes, this has worked, I'll have another prescription. Now, some it's almost miraculous. In others, it's more it's worked a bit. I might as well try it again. It's been a bit of a help, but not brilliant. So if you take a repeat prescription as a mark of success, then it's about 80 to 85% wanted again. And these are people who, remember, these are people who have tried everything and nothing has worked. So it's remarkably rewarding. And I think the doctors who've taken that step, that leap of faith, learnt about it, started to prescribe it, find it incredibly rewarding. As a neurologist, you know, neurologists are very good at diagnosing people with awful illnesses like multiple sclerosis and motor neuron disease and Parkinson's disease. We are pretty useless and limited about what we can actually do for people. So it's lovely for a neurologist to have a, a medicine that actually makes a difference to their patients in terms of their sleep or their appetite or their pain or their spasticity or their anxiety. It's remarkable. So it, as you say, it's down to education. I think it's Tony Blair that said education, education, education. That's the same with cannabis. It's absolutely essential to educate the doctors first, educate politicians, I have to say, second. But it's mainly the conservatism of the medical profession that's holding it back now. 
And do you see any of that softening at all? Have you got any ideas on how to improve that? It is softening. I, I do a monthly training session, mainly aligned to doctors. I used to get two or three doctors on those going back year, 18 months, which was fine, but slow. I now get routinely over 20, 20, 25, even 30 doctors on every monthly training session. Now, if that is a marker of something's happening, that's good. Now, OK, there's 30, what is 50, 60,000 doctors in this country, so there's a hell of a long way to go. But we don't need every doctor to prescribe it. You know, surgeons, orthopaedic surgeons or whatever, we're never going to want to prescribe it, really. We only need, really, I think, a few hundred good quality prescribing, maybe, say, a thousand good quality prescribing physicians. But you also need to educate the other doctors who don't want to prescribe to understand, to talk to the patient sensibly and say, yes, this it's worth a go. This might be helpful for you. We do sometimes still see the blanket, don't be ridiculous. You know, we've had parents of children who've suggested it and said, if you mention that again, you know, I'll refer you to social services. And that, that people have been referred to social services because they're talking about cannabis for their child. You know, it is just blind ignorance. I don't mind doctors not prescribing because they don't want to. I do mind doctors not prescribing because they don't understand and they're speaking to patients out of ignorance. And that's what we need to overcome, which we are very, very slowly overcoming. Yeah, there's some positive signs there. That's really useful to understand that. I mean, you talked a bit about the establishment, such as it is, and they speak in the language of clinical trials and clinical data. Maybe we could talk a bit about that. I mean, I'm not sure if this is accurate, but I have heard that UK physicians tend to like to see UK data. Yes, exactly. How much of that is true? It's sadly true. Some parts of Britain are fairly useless, aren't they? We've had... Some senior doctors say, well, and we've shown them papers from Israel or Canada or the States and say, well, that's, you know, that's foreign. We want British research, which when you think about it, that's awful, really, isn't it? It's dreadful. And of course, there's not much British research because it hasn't been legal until fairly recently. So why don't we learn from really good quality studies that have been done and are doing in Canada and Australia, in parts of the States? You know, let's learn from that. So, but there is still unfortunate British hierarchy medical attitude that only British research is really proper research which I just find mind-blowing really yeah but in today's global economy it's strange it's just is strange we'll catch up you know there will be that evidence that they want but if we look at it as a pharmaceutical product we'll be here forever more we'll be here for decades and decades and decades looking at every cannabinoid in isolation when you have to compare that with placebo, and then how do you combine them? Is this combination better than that combination? There are tens of thousands of combinations that you'd have to go through if you wanted to do it as a pharmaceutical placebo-controlled study. You can't do that. And what's the point of doing that? As I said several times, now, it's not a pharmaceutical, it's a plant. And we need to treat it as a plant, and that's what doctors can't get their minds around, that there's some medical benefit to a plant. Yeah. Having forgotten, of course, that medicine up to the 1930s was all plant-based. You know, it's, there wasn't a pharmaceutical product. Or, so they've sort of forgotten their medical history somewhat. Yeah, absolutely. And for those that do want to go down the route, you know, is there like public funding available to help with clinical trials? There are studies, yes. And the, the government said the National Institute of Health Research could give some priority to cannabis research. Last I heard, not one cannabis study had been approved. And now that may be because the quality of the studies being proposed is poor, or it may be they've still got an attitude that you can't really research cannabis properly. I don't want to comment on that any further, but just (laughs) draw your own conclusions that there's not one piece of NIHR research funded. But there are studies ongoing. If you look at clinicaltrials.org or .com, I think it's clinicaltrials.org, you can see worldwide all the studies that are going on in cannabis. You just type in cannabis, and there are hundreds of cannabis studies now And the literature is going up. When I did that study for the Parliament, there was around 20,000 references for clinical cannabis. Some awful studies, some pretty good studies, but 20,000 is a lot. There's now, in that five years, it's over 40,000. So the the research in cannabis has doubled in less than five years. So there's a lot happening because it's now easier to make it happen. Yes, yeah, absolutely. And hopefully that will continue. So to to touch, as we kind of near the end, you mentioned lobbying is sort of one of the things that you guys do. There's obviously lobbying on the other side as well. I mean, without going into sort of conspiracy theories and all the rest of it, but I'm sure there's some vested interest that kind of lobbying against cannabis. How, How do you see that interplay? 
There has been, yes. Not surprisingly, big pharmaceutical industry will lose money when cannabis is introduced because there's less prescription of opiates, there's less description of anti-anxiety drugs, anti-convulsant drugs. So that, and you know, take the states introduce medical cannabis there, and there's 25% less opioids prescribed. And 25% opioids is good for the person, but not good for the shareholders of the big pharmaceutical companies. So, you know, there is a serious lobbying against cannabis. We know that for certain from companies you wouldn't expect to lobby against it. There was a little bit of lobbying from big alcohol and big tobacco. There's less of that. I think if you can't beat them, join them is now the thing. And we are seeing, not in the UK yet, but we are seeing in Canada and the States, big alcohol, big tobacco and even big farm are now buying into cannabis. Because they see, well, okay, it's going to be here forever. Let's be part of that party. Some would say, well, we don't want big alcohol, big farmer, and big whatever into the cannabis industry. But nevertheless, that is now happening, which is good in the sense they're not antagonistic against it. Well, they probably are, but they're realising they're not going to get anywhere. Cannabis is here to stay. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, big business is always going to look yeah, opportunities, aren't they? Yeah, absolutely. There's opportunities in this industry. You know, it's the UK, we did a, Maple Tree did a report, 10 recommendations for government. And, you know, it's a multi-billion pound industry in this country alone, if it's developed properly. About, we estimated about 100,000 jobs could be created, let alone the tax income. I never thought I'd be advocating for tax income. But, you know, income tax for employees, corporation tax for the successful companies will generate income for the government and i think it's better frankly to get income for the government than income in the pockets of the criminal fraternity so you know that's a very strong economic argument for the government supporting this industry as a whole absolutely absolutely and you touched on the the recommendations you made to government maybe that's quite a good way to kind of end this interview Mm. maybe you can touch on maybe two or three of the highlights of the 10 recommendations that you made what would you like to see well i won't go through all 10 I think the one that will have most impact is getting GPs able to prescribe as primary prescribers. I think they'd be very good primary prescribers because a lot of the cannabis symptom controlling, like sleep and appetite and pain except at the severe end and anxiety except at the severe end, is a GP area. Let's get GPs to prescribe. And a study done by my colleague Leon Barron, a GP, showed about 30%, about a third of GPs would be happy to prescribe if they were able to initiate prescription. They can do follow-ups, but not primary. That's one, and that's easily done. That would take a stroke of a pen by the Home Secretary to change the statutory instrument on the legislation. That's one we're working on. We'd like nice or alternative body to look again at the recommendations, so it doesn't not so inhibiting. Looking at hemp, I haven't talked about hemp, and it's not my particular area, but you can get industrial hemp license in the UK to grow hemp, which is great, but then you have to destroy the flower in which there's the CBD, because hemp's mainly CBD, so you're burning the hemp flower in the field, so all the hemp we see on the shelves of Holland and Barrett and Boots and others is imported, I mean that's crazy. Why on earth don't we allow the cultivation, first of all, and then the extraction from the flower to get our own CBD industry going? And the CBD industry, the hemp industry as a whole, will be really, really good for the environment and good for well, good for employment again, good for income and such like. So that, that's just three off the top of my head. There are seven recommendations altogether. So that's what we're trying to work on. And ultimately, what we want to work on is realisation in the government. This is industry worth supporting with a, something like an Office of Medicinal Cannabis, like they have in other countries like Holland, where you get all the... We're not asking for more resources, but there's people in the Home Office, there's people in MHRAs, there's people in the Department of Health, people in the Department of Justice... Uh, DEFRA, all working on cannabis, but not talking to each other. Let's put them together in an office of cannabis, whatever you care to call it, and get more sensible, joined up, it's a bit of a cliche, but joined up government thinking. So that's what I'd love to see as a result of our lobbying, is an office of medical cannabis, office of cannabis, where we could really develop this industry in the UK. Yeah, absolutely. A great way to round it out. And that the CBD point around hemp is, you know, the, the analogy is growing an apple tree for the wood and throwing away the apples. Exactly. You throw away exactly that. That's a very good analogy. I must use that one. Thank you. <laughs> but you're right. Let's throw away the apples and just use the wood. It's crazy. Yeah, it is crazy. But thank you, Mike, for all the work you're doing in this area. It's really useful. And there's going to be loads more to come. So I'd love to have you back on the show at some point. Yeah, it'll be a pleasure. And, you know, every year we'll make some progress. Let's hope it's a more progress than the next year. That's been the last three, but we'll get there. Thank you for asking me. Thank you, Mike. Cheers. 
Thanks for listening. Hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, please subscribe, rate, review and share the podcast. It will help me spread the good word on how this amazing industry is developing. I work with various cannabis startups to help them get funded and grow. I also work with corporates and international cannabis companies to help them understand and navigate the European cannabis sector. We're working with some great clients across the cannabis value chain and we'd love to help you too. If you're interested, please visit www.canverse.global to get in touch.